In the fall of November 2015, Edie Anderson, along with nine others, were invited to serve as, the ambas as an ambassador for the Davis Finney Foundation. And since then, she has been spreading the message of hope for living well with Parkinson's. Edie is passionate about helping people with Parkinson's discover the physical, mental, and spiritual benefits of staying active. As a workout junkie, she swims, cycles, dances, and otherwise stays in perpetual motion. Edie shows by example how exercise is an integral part of living well and is here to tell her story. Edie, thank you so much for being here. I'm going to hop off and let you do it. Thank you, Mel, for that introduction. And I too have my little happy faces on my iPad. I even have a happy uh, picture of my family with my grandchildren smiling back at me. So I have my little audience here. And it truly is an honor for me to be able to speak to uh, this group about living well with Parkinson's. But some of you in the audience might be wondering, well, what are my qualifications for uh, speaking to you on this subject? After all, I wasn't introduced as a, um, a doctor or a therapist or a scientist. I was introduced as an ambassador, true, and that basically means that I'm one of many voices out in the community encouraging people with Parkinson's to, uh, to live well. But I'd like to draw your attention to the program, if you have it in front of you. If you look at the list of distinguished speakers that we've had today, they're all experts in their field. And one way we know that is by their credentials, and that's represented by the initials listed after their names. Some of the initials include MS, PhD, MD, DPT, and then there I am at the bottom simply listed as Eden Anderson, Davis Finney Foundation Ambassador. Well, they're not printed, but I do have initials, credentials you might say, and it reads Edie Anderson, PWP. You see, I too am a person with Parkinson's. So I feel your pain. I know your concerns. And I definitely share your frustrations. So we have a connection and that's important. And I'm hoping that by sharing my story with you, that you will apply the things that you've learned here today from the experts, as well as from the things that you'll learn when you read the Every Victory Counts Manual. Now, before I begin, I'd like to uh, address something, and that is a definition that I think is important. We use the term well or wellness freely. We're always saying, I hope you're well, get well soon, be well. Um, but what does it really mean? And by definition, wellness means when you balance three key aspects of your health, the physical, the mental, which includes your emotional, as well as your spiritual health. And all three require exercise and nutrition on a daily basis in order to achieve wellness. So if you can sort of file that away, uh, that would be great. The other thing I wanted to mention, I told you that I share your frustrations. And one of the biggest things that causes us to be frustrated is the fact that we can't, at present anyway, we can't fix this, we can't fix Parkinson's. And by nature, I think of people, of us, those of us in the audience, husbands, wives, parents, and grandparents, we're inclined to want to fix things that aren't working properly or that are broken. And who of us in the audience can resist a grandchild that comes up and says, man, I can you kids to make it better? And unfortunately, that's not something we can do right now with Parkinson's. Um, so let, let's move forward and uh, I'd like to share my story. Um, I call it changing stumbling blocks into stepping stones. Taking something that seems insurmountable, really big, and really difficult and reducing it either to the point where you can just get past it or at least manage it. And picture yourself hiking on, the, uh, on a trail in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia. And I can picture that because I used to live there and it's a beautiful place. And you start off on a path that's broad and spacious and easy to maneuver and you're walking along just fine. But then things get a little bumpy and a little rougher, and the path narrows. 
And suddenly you find yourself on the part of the mountain where on one side, the mountain is straight up and on the other side, it's straight down and the path is now a single lane. There's some rocks in the way, some ruts. So you have to be careful about where you place your feet. And then you come around the bend and oh boy, there's this boulder. And by boulder, I mean something bigger than you in your way. And when you encounter such a situation, you have basically two choices. You can look at the boulder and say, well, I can't do anything about that. And you give up. Or you can size it up. You can look at that thing and figure out how am I going to crawl over it, dig my way under it, or squeeze my way around it if there happens to be a little opening. Now, is it easy? <laughs> Not by any means. It's a difficult thing to do. It could leave, it could, it's painful. It could leave you uh, damaged and definitely leaves you with some scars. How do I know this? Well, I've had 15 major surgeries and I've got 35 surgical scars to show for it. So I've climbed over a few boulders. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm not here to talk about all 15 of those um, medical crises, but I am gonna talk about one thing prior to the Parkinson's diagnosis to kind of show you how you can compare the approach to dealing with things. So let's begin with my story and we're gonna rewind and go back about nine years. My husband and I are sitting in the doctor's office waiting for some test results. I don't have a real good feeling about this. And as soon as the doctor walked in the office, I could tell by the look on his face, wasn't gonna be very good news. So he sits down in front of me and he takes his chair and he scoots it all the way up to our knees are practically touching. And he leans in and he says, there is no easy way to tell you this. You have breast cancer. And before I could say anything or really react, he, he did something. He went like this. He said, look at me. And I did. I looked at him and he said, we can fix this. And I sat up and I said, okay. So we discussed the options. I was informed that it was a rare, aggressive type of cancer. So I had to be equally as aggressive with my uh, treatment plan. So we set the goal of getting well, fixing it. We put, it, put together an action plan, which included surgeries, chemotherapy, and other supportive therapies. Then we, we made a team, which is very important. And the team included not just doctors, nurses, technicians, but also included the support uh, group of family, friends, my congregation. They were there to encourage me, to reassure me of their love and their support. And that was the driving force for me to keep on going. And then another really important aspect of all of this is faith. Faith that you're going to achieve a positive outcome. And I'm happy to say that I'm sitting before you today, nine years later, as a breast cancer survivor, and that's a victory. So, let me bring you up a little bit uh, two years later. So now we're seven years ago. I'm in a similar situation, sitting in a doctor's office, waiting for test results. Didn't have a good feeling. And the doctor comes in and he leans in and he says, yes, you do have Parkinson's. And he took it a step further and he made sure that I understood. He said, now you understand you don't have an arm problem or a leg problem. You have a brain problem, which means if something's not working properly or you've lost the ability to do something, you're not likely to get that back. Oh, great. And then he said, so we can manage this, but there, wait a minute, there's something he didn't do and I was waiting for it. He didn't go look at me. And he certainly didn't say, I can fix this. 
not that he wasn't a good physician, he's an excellent doctor, so much so that even though I live in Florida, I still go back to Virginia to see him. So, okay, we, we came up with a plan. He said, well, we, we're gonna manage this. And we talked about diet, exercise, medication. Mm, I didn't want that, but didn't have much choice in the matter. And then he gave me a book and he said, I want you to read this. You need to educate yourself and make sure you understand all that's involved. And then he asked me a question. I thought it was a little bit unusual, but he wanted me to, I guess, think about setting a, a goal for the uh, future. He said, I want you to think about what you want to do in 10 to 15 years, and the next time I see you, we'll talk about that. So I said, oh, okay, I'll think about that. But let me go back to the book. The book that he gave me, and he said, do your homework. Well, I went home and I did my homework. I read that book. I read a dozen other books. Unfortunately, none of them were the Every Victory Counts manual. I wish I had had that at the time. But the books that I read were somewhat outdated. And the sense that I got from all of them was very depressing because they all talked about an expiration date. They all said, from the point of diagnosis, you might have five or 10 good years left, so make the best of it. <laughs> I wasn't okay with that. So now all of a sudden this boulder that I was facing got bigger. And in the shadow of that boulder, I found myself in the pity party. I think some of you out there know what that pity party is and it's not much of a party at all, is it? After all, there are no other people there. It's a one person party. There are no games, no prizes, and certainly no cake. And we don't wanna be there but we can't seem to get out, at least not without help. So we need a bigger, we need some support, some, some encouragement. Now, what some of you are thinking, well, what happened to that support system you had, your friends and your family and your congregation? Well, they were there. They assured me of their love and support and encouraged me, but they couldn't feel my pain they didn't know my concerns and they couldn't share my frustrations to no fault of their own because they don't have Parkinson's. So a very, very important aspect of improving our quality of life is that support system that we can only get uh, from being part of the Parkinson's community. So I encourage you all to do that. So when I finally did that myself and got myself to a support group meeting, there were two people there that ended up being very uh, important, very key in my uh, getting out of this pity party. One was a young man that uh, gave his experience and he talked about how exercise, which we've heard a lot about here today, how exercise saved his life. Because after diagnosis, he became suicidal. And it was um, his brother who challenged him to uh, train with him and to to run and to become a marathon runner and he actually did that he would he ran the New York City Marathon every year and one thing he said was as a result of that he didn't have to take his Parkinson's medication and that certainly got my attention I thought whoa I don't want to take medicine so I can exercise but I don't like running and I certainly had no intention of being a marathon runner so I knew I was gonna to have to figure out my own plan of action for exercise, which I eventually did. I wanna also mention the other person that played a key role, and it was a woman about my age. She'd had Parkinson's for a number of years. And after she listened to me whine about my problem, she looked at me and she gave me a little dose of tough love. And she said, Edie, these are the cards you've been dealt play your cards and then she leaned in and she said and play to win and she said that in all caps and it got my attention because at that point i realized that all this time i've been waiting for someone to come and get me out of this pity party when in fact it was me i needed to propel myself 
through that door and get out. And that's exactly what I did. I went from the pity party to the gym. I signed on to work with a personal trainer uh, for an eight week program. Uh, he evaluated my situation and he came up with a plan. He intended for me to get stronger, to have more stamina, to be more flexible, to work on balance, the whole picture. And I was really excited because this was a brand new gym that was owned by a hospital and it was designed to do uh, to pro for programming uh, for people just like me with chronic illnesses or recovering from surgery and things like that. And the gym was fantastic and it had stations uh, with TRX uh, stations and weightlifting stations, boxing, and rowing machines, and I couldn't wait to get started. So my personal trainer, his name was David, he took me in there and he walked me over to the wall and on the wall was a grab bar, kind of like the one you have in the shower. And he had this foam cushion, it was about three inches of foam and he put it on the floor and he said, we're gonna start here. And I said, excuse me? He said, I want you to stand on this cushion with your bad leg and we're gonna see how long you can stand on one leg before you have to grab the bar. So I leaned over and I said, now David, you know I have a brain problem, not a leg problem. And that's not gonna get better, so why are we doing this? So I said, well, you know, I understand that, but I think if we work on strengthening the muscles in your legs, improving your posture, which by the way was okay, but could be better, and working on your core strength, he says, I believe we might be able to improve on some of your balance issues. So I'm thinking to myself, this guy is tall, dark, and handsome, and really well built. I would have done anything he asked me. So I said, okay, okay, let's do it. So I focused on the spot as hard as I could. I concentrated as hard as I could. And I stood on that leg for all of three seconds. Well, after practicing that exercise for eight weeks, I went from three seconds to 60 seconds. And you know what? That's a victory because improving my balance was something I didn't think I could do. And it's a very important thing to work on because as has already been mentioned, balance aids in fall prevention. Falling being the number one cause of major uh, injury and death among people with Parkinson's. So if you can improve on your balance, then that goes a long way with uh, fall prevention. And at first I didn't think that could be done because of what the doctor said about once you've lost it, you can't get it back. But with balance, that's actually a learned behavior. It's already been mentioned here today. There is such a thing as muscle memory and neural pathways and that sort of thing that can uh, help us improve. So bottom line is you really can teach old dog new tricks. So some people have asked me, well, uh, what kinds of exercises do you like? Well, I, I, do, I try to do everything I can in the way of uh, weightlifting or like boxing and dancing and spin class and uh, walking on the beach. And quite frankly, uh, I go by the, the rule if, it, if you sweat, it counts when it comes to aerobic exercises. And I actually consider putting on my bike shorts as aerobic exercise because I break out the sweat when I do that. Other benefits <laughs> that I'd like to share with you uh, would include the fact that I'm more confident. I walk better, I talk better, um, and so I'm not afraid to be out in public and um, get out there. So, uh, and I'm looking forward to being able to do that more when things change. Remember I said I wanted to not have to take medication? Well, I can't say this is gonna happen for any of you, but. I did achieve that goal to the point where for about two years, I functioned with just half of my medication. And that too was a victory. 
And even now, I'm seven years into my diagnosis, and I'm still just taking the original dose that the doctor prescribed, with the exception of an additional little um, medication to help with this little tremor, which can be problematic. Something else that was, is a huge benefit to all of this, um, my doctor, after he does the physical exam, the mental test, he, he makes me spell things forwards and backwards, things like that. Um, he likes to sum it up by giving me a grade. And at first I was getting Bs, B pluses, and I thought, oh, I wanna get a better grade. And he's really hard to please. So I worked really, really hard. And about two years ago after my exam, he said to me, Edie, you're only the second person in my 40 years of treating people with Parkinson's who has worked hard enough to earn an A plus. Victory! So that was really, in my opinion, a, a huge accomplishment, and I wanted to share that with you. And the last thing I want to share with you, I told you that he asked me to think about what I wanted to do in 10 to 15 years. And my answer to him was, I want to dance at my grandchildren's weddings. And at first he scrunched up his face and wasn't sure if I could do that. But after I got that A plus, he also said, and I do believe that you will be dancing at their weddings. And one thing I want to share with you is that I can't wait till the invitation comes. I have to start dancing now and I have to keep dancing until I get the invitation to go up to those weddings. And in conclusion, I would like to invite all of you to dance with me. Thank you.